Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. My name is Sarah Brown and I'm joined by my friend and colleague Chris Collins. We both work at Garden Organic and we're here to bring you tips and advice each month on how to grow the organic way. Well, there's no doubt that spring has sprung and us gardeners everywhere are out and about and loving that first warmth of the sun on our back. Oh, it's so good to be growing again. So what have we got for you this month? Well, our guest uses the garden as a healing place. He's head gardener Ashley Edwards, and he tells us all about his work in Horatio's Garden, which is attached to a hospital which deals with spinal injuries. In the ward, it's very enclosed. It's got smells of chemicals, it's got fluorescent lighting. So it's the chance to get outside in the fresh air, to watch birds, have a look at the flowers, like that is such a relief for people. And I think you'll love our postbag questions. How to plant out a small fruit tree in a pot? What to do with seedlings that have failed? Yes, it happens to all of us. And what are your thoughts on whether we can call slugs garden pests? But first, a word from our wonderful sponsor, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. You can check out their catalogue online at organiccatalogue.com. You'll find a complete range of organic gardening products from seeds and plants to equipment. Have a look at their latest offer on a mini greenhouse cloche. It's at organiccatalogue.com forward slash POD3. And don't forget, if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. So here's Chris waiting for us in the potting shed. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? I'm good, Sarah. How about you? You good? Yeah, yeah, I am. Thank you. And I'm at the stage now where I'm beginning to prick out my little seedlings. Have you got to that stage as well? I have. I have. This is what I've been doing this week. And very, very therapeutic and satisfying is too. Isn't it? (laughs) It's quite an important thing to do, especially for me here in the flat, because in in a building that you live in, the light levels tend to be low. So my seedlings tend to be quite tall after germination. And pricking out gives me the opportunity to sink them down a bit lower. And I like to bury them quite deep. And then they'll root out from their stems and I get a tougher plant, a stronger plant. So um, it's very traditional prick out for a gardener, but I am a traditionalist when it comes to seedlings and pricking out, definitely. I think the other thing to remember when you're pricking out, which is this transposing of your little seedling into a bigger pot, it's the root that's the important part. So don't touch that root. Hold it by the leaf. And then, as you say, gently lower it down into the compost. Root and stem, I would say. And I'll tell you what, if I done my pricking out city and gill phase one and touched the root or the stem, I would have failed automatically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's where you, if you've got your hands on, the, you can lose a bit of the cotyledon in the leaf. You can damage that a little bit. The plant will survive. If you damage the stem or the root, it's game over. Think of it that way. is a good way to look at it. Yeah. And I'm also now looking out at my veg patch and getting that ready. I'm emptying the compost bin, putting it out onto the veg patch itself, and then I can start afresh with a new compost bin. But Chris, you're thinking about creating a whole new veg bed, aren't you? Well, I'm going to do a little one on my balcony. So I've kind of got the, my, my allotment is looking like a coiled spring at the moment. It's really ready to go. I'd like you. I've, I've gently forked in a lot of my compost. It's all kind of ready. My tatties are in, my onions are in. It's all good. But I was thinking about growing a bit more food on the balcony this year. And I was like, how do I do that and do it cheap as possible, really, or as easily as possible? And I f- discovered these sort of felt containers, which you buy them as a flat pack almost. They're made out of recycled materials. It's only about eight quid and it's 60 centimetres long, 30 centimetres wide. 30 centimetres deep and you unfold it it's got handles so I'll put that out on the balcony I'll fill it with peat-free potting compost and I'll grow my salads in it I think but that sounds brilliant yeah I'll have a little salad bar out there so I tend to multi-sow salads over so every three weeks in between each row I'll sow some fresh ones and I just keep it going so you can kind of graze it you know fresh salad every night or in your sandwich you can't knock that can you and I really like the idea that that's going to fit into any space I mean for you it's a balcony but anyone who's got a small garden this is a perfect way of just having your little corner where you can grow your own veg and your own salads and then the rest of the space can be your pot plants or where you sit with your cup of tea or whatever it just shows that no matter how small your space you can make it productive and creative exactly i think there's always a bit of a myth with food growing that you need lots of land to do it i do it in quite small spaces on the balcony and i get more than i can eat to be fair sarah you know you don't need a lot if you're clever with your repeat sowing and you grow properly so you do it's not about space just give it a go you'll find it's easier than you think it is 
Are you sewing outdoors yet? Well, I am certainly considering it. It's been really warm in London to, at the end of March, uh, coming into April. So what I like to remember, I spoke before about putting fleece down to sort of trap the heat in the soil. The heat's there. I put my fingers in it the other day and it is nice and toasty. So I'll, I'll try and trap that. Then I'm looking at sowing the sort of temperate crops in the next couple of weeks. I'll sow carrots, beets, radish, because they'll come up quite quickly in that warm soil. And then I can start cropping them in another sort of two months, eight weeks time. So yeah, I am thinking of that. If I was further north, still a lot of frost about. The one thing I think I fear is cold winds. So I won't put anything tender like tomato or anything out like that for a long time yet, because those cold winds will damage it and the odd late frost. But your beets, your carrots, I think they like a little bit of cold early on. Stops them bolting, stops them going too quick. I like the way you mentioned that you put your fingers in the soil. I do exactly the same. I lay my hand down on the soil and that just gives you a feeling of how warm it is. And I also think another indicator is the weeds. So if the weeds are really beginning to push on and put on growth, then the chances are your soil is ready and warmed up. You know, weeds have their place in the garden and they, they can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> They're opportunists, aren't they? So if they think the conditions are right, they'll go. Always sowing drills, though, because otherwise you won't know your weeds from your lettuce seed. That's quite yeah, important too. Yeah. That's so true. And I think there's also something interesting about April as a month. I mean, I know from experience we have a huge range of weather. We can start off with a heat wave and we can finish up with blizzards. In a funny sort of way, it's the most demanding month of gardeners from a weather point of view and from therefore from a care of your plants point of view. It's wonderful. It engages you 100 percent as a gardener. Your skill comes through now, I think. And I've juggled so many plants in this month. I really do. I'm under the cost with it a bit. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just that it's time I'm so busy doing it as well as my normal life. And I just think that you need to kind of keep over things. Don't be neglectful. Don't don't shrug it off. Always check your plants. I always mention this phrase bonding with your plants. April's a month to do that, you know, especially all those babies you've got and you're growing them on. Just be aware. Don't know what the weather's going to do. Be particularly aware of those cold winds, though, because they can kick in from east and that will check your progress. Yeah. And watering. Watering, you can get a very dry April as well. So, yeah, the key message is be on the ball. Come out (laughs) of the starting gates and be on the ball. As we always say, organic gardening, a lot of it is observation. Just keep your eyes out, keep them peeled and you'll be all right. I suspect we'll be starting to get aphid attack by the end of the month as well. And that, that's because the aphids love those young plants, that new growth, which is full of sap. And it's very easy for them to access that through the soft tissue of the young plant. But do you remember the message? Don't panic. <laughs> wait for the predators. And by that, I mean those aphid eating insects like ladybirds and lacewings or even the blue tits, the birds. They would need those aphids to feed their young. So either squish them yourself by hand or wash them off with a jet of water. Don't, for goodness sake, spray them with any chemicals. If you have broad beans on the move and you've overwintered them, you'll see they are putting on growth now. Just pinch out the tips as well. Now, they are black aphid will love those tips, so you can reduce them by just pinching out those tips. And by the way, they make a great addition to a salad. Like, oh, don't they, they just? Tasty. I'd like yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And another little tip that I would pass on is I'm looking at my herbs. A lot of them are in pots in a corner and they're putting on new growth. So what I'm doing is I'm taking off the top 10 to 15 centimeters of old soil and I'm replacing that with a mixture of fresh topsoil mixed with compost so that'll just refresh the soil that those herbs are growing in I don't need to completely repot them but that'll give them a a boost for the growing season and I'm guessing the mowers out this month not for you Chris on your balcony but it is for (laughs) me and I will be again like I did last year I don't need to cut all the grass down to have that perfect lawn I leave some areas unmown because I know that sort of relaxed approach will provide habitat for insects for birds smaller wildlife but I do like to have paths cut through it because that looks quite intriguing and I also like one particular area to be mown because that's where I sit with my cup of tea and my husband so (laughs) yeah it's nice to do a bit of mixed mowing see if you can work that into your space i think also remember your first cut don't go too short leave a good good load on it it's been through the winter if you cut it short now you might yellow it up also you want you've got clover and plants like that in it they're massively important for uh, pollinators early pollinators so make sure you keep it good two and a half centimeters minimum don't take it down too low and, uh, and it'll look nice and neat for your cup of tea when you go out with your husband, Sarah. Cup of tea and birdsong. <laughs> what more can you ask for? Exactly. Chris, you have a plant of the month this month? 
I, I tell you what, it just looks incredible. It has looked incredible. I suppose it might be coming to the end now in April, but it's been the Magnolias this year. I just ah, think yes. they've just been incredible. The amount of energy that plant puts into flowering. The Sulengianas, which is the big cup, almost velvet-like flowers, pinky white flowers, and Stellata, which is the like star-shaped ones. Um, they have just been magnificent. And I wonder if any scientist has ever, ever done a, 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 an assessment of how much calorie a plant like that uses for that kind of flower display. Because it really has been, look at me. And I know we're coming out the other side of it in April. You know, it tends to be end of March, early April. But buy yourself a little magnolia. Give it pride of place because it just lifts the spirits at this time of year. It really does. Yeah, that's a lovely thought. They're almost tropical, aren't they, in their look? Well, it's funny you should say that. I was in Malvern recently and I was walking down the hill to get the train. And there was a kind of like a building site sort of place. And then behind the back was a magnolia. And I suddenly felt like I was in Africa because you just see this huge splurge of pink. And it just looks so exotic. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, well, you know, you don't need to go to the other side of the world to see exotic sites. The magnolia will give you one right here, right now. I love it. OK, Chris, well, I'm not going to keep you any longer because I know you're raring to get outside. But before we leave the shed, Chris, as you know, I've got a final bit of news for listeners. This, sadly, is going to be my last episode, and I'm afraid the time has come for me to hang up the microphone. Before I go, I just wanted to remember some of the highlights that you and I have had over the past three years. I mean, I'm remembering particularly your fabulous interview with Tony Kirkham from Q, all about your shared love of trees. Oh, do you remember we had Dave Goulson talking about insects, the terrible, terrifying insect apocalypse? And we had Charles Dowding talking about the secrets of no dig. It's It's been the most fantastic three years of podcasting, Chris. It really has. Well, I think it's important for people to listen to this, uh, how much work you've put into it, Sarah. There would be none of this podcast wouldn't exist without you. And it's been interesting for me when I, you know, I spend a lot of time on the road. I travel a lot with my job. So I talk to a lot of different people and all of them. The first compliment about the podcast is the banter me and you have when we do it. There's Ah. big shoes to fill here, basically, Sarah, that's for sure. (laughs) And I just think that kind of natural share of information has been, it's been very special for me. It's a sad day for me, to be honest with you. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gutted, to be honest. Um, That's very nice of you to say so, Chris. Thank you. And what I've loved about working with you is I have learned so much from you. I think we all have because you have huge practical knowledge. But more importantly, I think you, you bring the soul into gardening. You often refer to how it does good for the spirit. The whole organic message is so integral in what you say and what I say and what we all do. I think that's the important thing to hang on to. Before we just cover ourselves in tears and miss out. <laughs> Don't I, well it up, Al. No welling up. <laughs> no, I'm not welling up, but I just thought we might go out with a laugh. Now, you may not know this, but behind scenes, I've been catching a few bloopers between well, you I, and I. Know I. There have been, I know there have been a few over the years. Oh, <laughs> uh, only a few. So here's just two or three to make us smile, just to remind us of how it's not always as easy as it looks. Right. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Garden Organic Podcast. I'm here with Jean Veron. I'm here with Jean Vernon. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to the Garden Organic Podcast. I'm here with June Ver- Jean Vernon. Hi, let's start Chris. that again, let's start that again, that's bloody useless. I'm on an allotment now with Debbie Sanderscock. Diana Sandercock. <laughs> I think we might start that one again, Dan. <laughs> with Diana Sanderscock. Sandercock. It's like Sanderson, but it's cock. And- <laughs> I'm on an allotment now with... <laughs> no, we're both laughing. <laughs> Um, Francis, I'm going to ask you now, you, you have a big television presence with, on, oh God, what's it called? Love My Garden. Love Your Garden. Francis, I'm now going to ask you about your television presence. You, you're you on Love My, Love My, Love Your Garden. Love Your Garden. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, Chris, recording podcast isn't without its perils. Brilliant. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you, dear friend and dear fellow gardener and say good luck to everyone, everyone who's out there having a wonderful April, growing the organic way. And back to you, Sarah. All the best, yeah. I'm going to miss you. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Well, the exciting thing is that Chris will be joined by a new voice next month. I won't spoil the surprise, but rest assured it'll be another friend and colleague from Garden Organic. So moving on, let's take that visit I promised earlier to a particularly special garden. One that's designed to be therapeutic and bring healing to all who visit it. Here's Chris on a cold sunny day back in early March. 
I'm here with Ashley Edwards, who's head gardener at Horatio's Garden. Thank you, Ashley, for coming on to our podcast. We're very grateful. Um, yeah, kick us off. Tell us a little bit about the purpose of the garden. Well, thanks for having me, and I can't wait to talk about the garden, because I love it. Um, and it is built for patients here at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. It's a beautiful sanctuary for people that have been dealing with a life-changing injury. It provides a place where people can come out. It's fully accessible. They can come straight from their ward into the garden, it's got year-round colour and interest, and it's designed by Tom Stuart Smith and his team. So there's, yeah, always something to see. Really important to patients. So you kind of mentioned that um, it's people with life-changing injuries. What, what kind of people, injuries are we talking about, if you don't mind me asking? So all the patients here have some form of spinal injury, and that could be from an accident. Car um, accidents. Yeah. Kind of stuff, that, yeah. That, so you're talking yeah. about people that are wheelchair-bound? Not always wheelchair-bound, but they will have some mobility restrictions, so they may not be able to walk or they may need assisted walking with crutches right and so the garden has been designed with that in mind so what kind of features are, have you got working here that helps them with that so one of the most important things is to have a completely flat surface and if you're new to a wheelchair it can be quite tricky so that's an, uh, an important factor that there's no bumps or lumps it's completely smooth and because many people's spinal injuries suffer with muscle spasms and if you have cobbles, for example, which this garden did have before, that is not good for um, things like spiders. So they're jarring. It can set, yeah, yeah, it can set yeah. something off, yeah. So I think that's probably the most important thing. And then we also have things like raised beds. We have this raised bank that patients can be eye level with from a wheelchair. We have all automatic doors. The most important thing is that there's no barriers to getting outside. And you're once you're in the garden, you're not reminded of your disability right okay so you move around it freely and, you, and it's exactly. both mentally and physically you're talking about. yeah the mental benefits are huge we always get patient comments telling us how meant how much it's meant to them being able to go outside in the ward it's very enclosed it's a clinical atmosphere you know it's yeah you've got smells of chemicals you've got fluorescent lighting you're in a room with four three four people you mm. don't know and you're going through this life-changing injury so the chance to get outside in the fresh air to watch birds have a look at the flowers like that is such a relief for people and in a way it's normality isn't it that's what we experience every day so they're having that normality as well it yeah. takes their mind away from it yeah and i think it's a chance to to ground yourself in nature process what's happened so here we have um, outdoor buildings, pods that people can go inside and have a private conversation on the phone, uh, something as simple as that. Or, you know, maybe have a cry or yes. just, just have an emotional moment that, where they can have a bit of privacy. Sure, sure. And so and in a way, do they also, do they join in with the gardening? Do they partake in it? Do you have that kind of relationship with them? Yeah, some people are, are really up for it. So they, they want to sow seeds and take cuttings <laughs> and they take a lot of interest. And I get lots of questions about um, plants in the garden because Tom Schutzmith has chosen some quite unusual things. So we do get lots of questions, which is a great way to engage people. Yeah. And yeah, and, and some people just want to come out, try and chat with the volunteers. Yeah, it's very social, um, which is nice, especially in times when we're not allowed visitors. It's sure. super important. So that interaction is a big part of it for you, isn't mm. it? Yeah. And obviously I can see by your face you really enjoy this job, right? Really, And it's a unique job. Not many egg gardeners would take this kind of thing on, yeah. I don't think, in some ways. But you, you obviously really enjoy it. What, what, what do you think you get from it? What, what attracted you to it? For me, it was working with people. I've always loved horticulture and people together. And I think there's a lot of power in plants to elevate people's well-being and that's a huge passion of mine. So yeah, that was a, a really big draw. Yeah, just the amazing work that the charity does. It's just, it was something to me that was so unique and made so much sense. Right, it, it strikes me you're quite a selfless character. You obviously like to contribute. Is that, is that right to say? I do, yeah. yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I like to give uh, back to people and I take a lot of pleasure from that and, I've, and I find it very fulfilling and especially to teach, be able to teach people new skills. Yeah. A lot of people that come here have never gardened. A lot of people, Londoners, don't have gardens. So a majority of my patients, I'm teaching them brand new skills and that I find really exciting. So how do you go about them? Do you just set workshops? Do you get them to join in like that? Well, it's quite structured here. So we work really closely with the occupational therapy team and we have a really good relationship with the ward um, and they're really supportive of us. Yeah, occupational therapy book in sessions every day. Um, so I offer slots, one hour slots, right. two a day, and then people can book in. Um, and yeah, we have quite a structured hour where we do, um, it's depending on their fun hand function or what they want to achieve during the, 
session we'll kind of tailor it yeah so i suppose you need quite a lot of patience as well that's quite i mean yeah. all gardeners have patience yeah. but that must be that must be a big part of the job and then get them to make sure they hit their goals they hit their targets in a way i think so but also it's it's supposed to be leisurely it's supposed to be fun it's something uh, away from the clinical side and it's a chance for people to do something different yeah and also it's about what they can do so when patients have a life-changing injury it's often you know they they think a lot about what they can't do anymore mm. so i like to try and show people they can still garden or they can learn to garden if they've never gardened before it's something that they can continue to do and that's quite powerful i think yeah very much so it's, it's brilliant and you must have made some quite unique friendships here and there <laughs> over the time is it yeah you do get attached to the patients <laughs> and there's and you know some stories are very harrowing and when they leave, you wish them well, and and I, I just hope that they continue gardening, really. Yeah, because it's, it's it is just a wonderful subject, no matter who or what you yeah. are, wherever you are. And but often, what we'll do is give patients something to go home with. So, if they've taken a cutting of a geranium that they like from the greenhouse, they can take that home and care for it, and it's you know something a little memento. <laughs> yeah, of this place, yeah. and of your of your of horticultural garden. expertise, yeah. hopefully as well. Yeah, so. So that's amazing. I'm, I'm quite interested in this as well. Obviously, in this country, we have a lot of care. People who are unseen or out in the community who care for for somebody maybe disabled or par- elderly parent that kind of thing. Do you have any tips if they if they had a garden of their own how they could engage their person they were looking after? Yeah, I think that it's important to have something for every season. Even in the depths of winter, you want something that will draw you out. So, and scented plants. I mean, in the winter, you could have things like witch hazel and mm-hmm. soccer cocoa, you know, to get you out there. And also, planting for wildlife, I think, is super important because that adds a whole other level of engagement. If you're watching pollinators or you can go out and see birds. Yeah, small bird life is just such an yeah, crucial part of the Yeah, it's such a joy to go out and just walk, sit and watch that. And then in terms of access, try and make it as accessible as possible, pathways, if you can, raise beds. But obviously that's, it can be quite expensive. So you can use containers, um, you could even use things like bins. and. So you can, yes, I think it's important to say, isn't it, that size of garden or area is not really that... You can garden on a minuscule scale, yeah. you really can. You can even keep a few house plants. You can have like, house plants, yeah. you can make a terrarium, you could do a succulent bowl, we do lots of those here. Windowsill herbs and, you know, micro salads, which we do a lot of. So, yeah, there's there's lots of things you could do. Yeah. Even yeah. if you don't have a garden. <laughs> yeah, that's true, isn't it? So what, so what got you into garden personally then? I always had an interest in nature and gardening and I was lucky in that I, I actually lived in a flat, I never, I never had a garden, um, but the neighbour downstairs would invite us out um, to come and enjoy the garden, basically. So, yeah, we would, we would, um, I would go in the garden, sow seeds. I remember sowing calendula seeds as a child. So that definitely sparked an interest in me from a young age. Yeah. And then also my nan and my aunt used to take me to Kew Gardens and I remember like going in the palm house and being amazed by these tropical palms and you know when you're small it's real like a real jungle in there. So yeah I think from an early age I enjoyed it and then I worked at a garden centre and I, I started wanting to learn more about the names of plants and did an RHS call. Then I went to Kew, I did my diploma at um, did Kew, Kew did Gardens. You? Yeah, oh, I didn't know so that really, I that's good, yeah because I worked at Kew for a while. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, so I was at the diploma, that was 10 years ago now. <laughs> right, so that's, that's really interesting because really then, as far as qualifications go you're right, up. I did Edinburgh, so you did Kew, okay, kind of, yeah, I was yeah. like a bit snobby about it, I was in there like the yeah, Oxford and Cambridge of all time. Oh yeah, there's a lot of rivalry going on. Yeah, yeah, but so you're, you're thoroughly trained and experienced. That makes me more curious why, you know, obviously this is, must be a real passion working somewhere like here. I just really wanted to use my, my horticultural skills, if I can, to help people. Yeah. And that's what I can do here, and that's such uh, an amazing feeling to yeah. be able to do that, help people through gardening this kind of seems like it suits you per- perfectly doesn't it really and, it didn't know. seem that way when <laughs> yeah. i read the description i was like i think this job is for me <laughs> yes that's brilliant i really love that i love that well we're going to go on to the big o words because i know that's what you practice here organic so what are your four yes. favorite ways of going about being an organic gardener well obviously we don't use any kind of sprays here and in terms of pest control i mean we don't have any real issues and i think it's because the garden is so biodiverse it's planted so well that you've got a rich tapestry really of all sorts of insects and and beneficials as well so we get lots of ladybirds lace wings all sorts of things coming in and we're quite lucky because we are surrounded by trees and we're right next to a big country park so i think that helps i think things come and visit us as well (laughs) so that's interesting you're saying because this is a big thing i think for i know for garden organic certainly is for me on my allotment 
Yeah. Having that having that mixed sight, not to, you know, having that really, having that diversity is a really big part of it, isn't it? It is, yeah. And the more di- diverse you can make your planting, the healthier it's going to be in the long term. And I think you know, soil health is really important yeah. as well. Are you a big composter, I tell you. Yeah, actually, we have a little compost heap that we um, we've got. We've, it's getting there. We've uh, <laughs> we've got a first kind of lump of compost out of it, so that's really good. And um, yeah, we try and recycle as much of the waste here as we can, green waste uh, into compost. Obviously, it's limited because it's a hospital site. Yeah, you sure. can't really have a big scale compost in. And leaf mold as well. We've, we've been collecting yeah. leaves, so I'm hoping to have some leaf mold, which is you know amazing for the soil. Yeah, so you can even use sow seeds in it as well, very low yeah. nutrient. I mean, I always think it's just this free massive lunch that falls out of the sky in autumn, isn't it's it? It's true. It's like such a shame to let it go to. Yeah, I would just imagine a massive worm party underneath yeah. the soil when it when it they all fall. <laughs> and how about with your patients here? Do you relay the organic messages to them? I do, and I try to not uh, not in a preachy way, but I. <laughs> I, I you don't strike me as a sort of man who <laughs> preaches to people. I always try and tell people the effects of it. You know, having chemicals available red, like readily off of shelves, people don't always think, well, this could be a really dangerous product. Yeah, I just think it's, it's weird because on my allotment site, a guy was spraying his apple tree the other day and I was just thinking, and I said, why? And he didn't seem to know the answer to that. Yeah, you know, something like, you do. Because we do grow vegetables in the greenhouse. You know, I always talk to people about the benefits of growing your own and you can do it without chemicals. And, we, you know, that's what we do here. So yeah. I think that helps, yeah, showing <laughs> yeah. people the results and letting them taste the results. Josh, yeah. all that must apply very strongly in a hospital environment. Yeah, it does. And, you know, nutrition is a big part of a patient's stay here. It's something that they do have to really take into account and I always you know tell people to grow organically because it's just better for the planet it's better for the flavor it's better for the uh, biodiversity uh, so let's um, walk around this garden and, I'll, oh, yeah. and I'm interested to see the plant and get you to chat about that yeah let's do that next day great right? fantastic well we're outside in the garden actually we're, we're looking at these raised beds in front of us so these raised beds are obviously very very important to you and obviously mate and to the patients here the people who use the garden um just describe them to me how they've been put together so we've got a bank which is held back by a retaining wall and that retaining wall is covered in zinc cladding could be sat on by somebody yeah um, so it could be u- used as seating and it's at a height where if you are in a wheelchair you can wheel up and you can be at eye level with the plants you can reach over and touch them We've got things like the Perovskia, which has scented leaves and stems. Yeah. So you could reach out and, and rub the stems. You could run your hands over the grasses. Yeah, it's, it's a chance to be up close to the plants at eye level. Brilliant. And then is that, that tactile, that touching the plants and smelling the plants, that's an important part of it, all do you think? Yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. It's, it's a huge part of it to be able to engage in that way, to be stimulated by this, your senses. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And so here we've got shrub border with ground cover. The epimedium's absolutely stunning. So and that, and that goes all the way down here, there, does it? Yeah, so we've got a raised bank all the way along with quite mature trees in it, which we're really lucky to have. And then underneath, yeah, kind of like woodland ground cover plants and grasses, things like ruscus, and we've got shrubs, euphorbias and daphnes, so lots of scent as well. In the yeah, garden, sure. Um, is really important. We've got hellebores just starting to poke out now. And we also planted 12,000 bulbs. Did you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Plus, so, a few blisters there. Then. Yeah, so thornies <laughs> and, um, yeah, so in the spring it, it, it looks it's going to look ma- magnificent. Yeah. So you've got a big celebration of spring going to yeah, go on in there. it in goes the... on and on. <laughs> did his patients get involved with planting bulbs or was that a garden and volunteer thing? We did do some in pots, but um, the, the in the beds, yeah, we were volunteers. They worked really hard to get them all in. You also have these like island beds here as well, because they must be quite easy for, to get round if you're, say, in a wheelchair. Or... And this side of the garden is much more colourful than the other side, which we'll see afterwards. It's described as the gregarious side of the garden. Right. It is a social space. People will gather here yeah. in front of the garden room, which is there's, this there's large a building here, building. Which, which is very... Uh, it, bright colours are obviously quite important to yeah, it. Yeah, right? so there's lot... The windows are all in kind of bright primary colours, really. It adds a, a real joy, and especially in the winter, it shows up really yeah. nicely. And the idea is that it, it, it doesn't look clinical at all. It, right. looks, it looks homely, it looks inviting. Uh, you don't feel like you're in the hospital environment. Right, so that's yeah. a break to get, to get that sort of escape away from the wards, yeah. away from the, the, uh, the sterilised sterilized sort of angle of the Yeah, just to have, not so much to escape, but just to have a moment in a different kind of environment. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the room here, that's where you can do, obviously, your workshops with them. Yeah, so we do. Showing. So my garden administrator, uh, Tracy, she's brilliant. She does lots of craft work. So she teaches brand new skills like paper rolling and 
they do uh, sinotyping and wow. all sorts of really interesting craft skills and sewing. She's a great seamstress. So <laughs> she she... loads of lavender bags. So it's a there. real hard of activity yeah, then, definitely. this room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the gravel beds in the resin, as you can see, they're kind of curved and the whole beds kind of follow this curving pattern. And that's really great for people that are new to their wheelchairs. They can kind of practice so they can get going used around to bends, mm. get used to yeah being in, in their chair and they might have a new chair, maybe they've got a power chair. And the curves are really nice, aren't they? Because there's nothing hard about the area. It's all very yeah, flowing and, and it smooth. flows. It, it draws you down the garden. You want to you wanna meander. So we just walk on a bit here then, so... But Fatsy is here. Yeah, um, so we've got Fatsy. Tetrapanics, is it? Yeah, Tetrapanics. Yeah. So quite exotic here then, did you say? Yeah, lots of interesting textures. Uh, and then we've got camellias. We've got hydrangea Annabelle further down, which looks amazing in the summer. And we've kept the heads on it now, so it does have winter interest. Um, yeah, I would only take them back in the spring, probably early spring. Because that's a feature, isn't it, those lovely... Definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We've got lovely hellebores, scented daphnes, and then in the summer it's full of salvias. Amistad is here with um, that deep purple, it's in very yeah. Horatio Garden colour. And then loads of viburnum venariensis, which is great for bees, butterflies, they love it. So we have lots of insects visiting in the summer. It's a hive of activity, is it? This bit's really nice, they've got four sort of curved beds here with a mm. path running through. That That looks very full and mature now. Yeah, it? and this is a real little sun trap, this area. And then lots of ground cover, so that helps to suppress the weeds naturally do things organically is yeah. throw a ground cover yeah so you're not going to expose soil as much as possible less weeding less watering yeah less weeding and and it just creates a healthier ecosystem I think yeah, yeah. you said you had a, a greenhouse that you uh, yeah used? so we'll, we'll now we'll go to the other side of the garden which is right. more kind of woodland in its style and yep. we'll also have a look at the greenhouse and I'll tell you one thing I've neglected to ask you which might be quite important when was the gar actually garden built so it was built during 2018 2019 it was opened September 2019 right so it's very new then isn't it yeah so it's so a year and a half Right. Um, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't really know that looking at the planting. It's really great. I was going to say that. It's, yeah, it's looking yeah. quite much. Obviously, got a good gardener looking after it, actually. <laughs> and the uh, interesting thing is, I mean, the amazing thing is really the achievement of you know, everyone that worked on this project. It was done during the pandemic. Right. So, um, I mean, that must have made things a lot trickier. The first thing that strikes me when I get here is these multi stemmed. Um, Betulas, birches, Jack Monty, or something like that. Yeah, or, that's right. Or, yeah, yeah, so they're very beautiful. That, that one's actually set into the path. Yeah, so they're actually planted into the resin and it was something that patient feedback was they wanted to be able to sit under a tree right. uh, or feel the shade of a tree. So this was the first Horatio's Garden to introduce that really so yeah patients can get right up next to the tree and you know rub the so bark so again that tactile and that yeah and silver and... birch are quite tactile you want yeah. to stroke the bark it's smooth <laughs> yeah. and they peel and yeah it's yeah, brilliant. And, and, and your, so these are the pods you were describing. So we've got three pods on this side of the garden and they are sort of like smaller versions of the large garden room. They're more for private conversations. Maybe if you have a visitor, you can go in there. Sure. So they've been used a lot because without these, actually visits wouldn't have been able to take part because they can't happen on the wall. Right, moment. because of the, uh, the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, because so, of COVID right. situation. I think it's, you know, people don't realise, obviously this has been the front line really. It's just been told to stay indoors. Mm. But if you were a patient here, that must have been quite hard for us. Uh, yeah, it's definitely had a huge impact. Yeah. Um, I know from patients that have told me that this has really helped them. The garden has been a space that's helped them. So you've played a really important role to them, really, through this one. I'm well, not, you know, <laughs> really, though, it's true, isn't it, in a I way? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not blushing on me, so no. you're all right. <laughs> no, but you have, in all seriousness. Yeah, and I feel very I feel very privileged that I can do that, you know, mm. that, that's, that my part of my job is to be here for people and support them and, and garden with them and just, yeah, it, it makes coming to work really amazing. Yeah, excellent. You're really enjoying it, aren't you? I can see. I love it. Even yeah. in cold winter's days to yeah, that I side. Like it. <laughs> it's always better to be outdoors. And you've got this, this has got a big feature here, so every garden needs a water feature. This is quite snazzy, isn't it? Quite modern. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah it's quite bougie, actually. So <laughs> yeah. it's, this is a um, round water feature, and then it's got a granite top. Yeah. And in that granite top are these small fountains in a kind of circle, and they create a beautiful ripple on the surface. Yeah, it's and stunning. They're actually. lit up as well. So yeah, at night time. Yeah, yeah, it must be really beautiful. Almost like little flames. It's like watching a fireplace. Yeah. It's quite mesmerising. And uh, the patients like that, I should imagine they yeah, do. They, yeah, and, you know, the sound of water has been shown to really improve well-being. They can actually see it from their walled window, which is lovely. Yeah, and the trees are lit up as well, I see. The trees are, people can kind of come out here whenever 
whatever they want, really. <laughs> Having a break between their physio sessions. Their days are very full. Sure. You know, the schedule is super busy. So uh, people often come out here to take a break. And right, staff cause... as well, not just patients. Sure, for everybody involved then, basically. And... Yeah. Because you can imagine, like, you've got to wear a mask all day long and it's a chance to kind of take a quick breather outside to get some fresh air. Yeah, very important. Yeah, yeah very important. Well, you've got a very fancy Dan Greenhouse yeah. here, I can see. Isn't it? The greenhouse. What? Well, that's a gardener's dream, isn't it? Look at the size I of it. it. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of my favourite places. Um, I it's, mean, it's one of the hubs of the garden, really. I do most of my garden workshops in here. It's a great all-weather place to bring people. Yeah, it's, a, it's your nerve centre, isn't it, the greenhouse? Yeah, it is. And, you know, you've got full light coming in and you feel like you're outdoors, but yeah. you can still be warm inside. Mm. So, come in. It's nice and warm in here. Oh, yes, sir. I mean, this is great. This is really good. So you got what, a lot of pele- your pelagonium. Pelagoniums. Fan? This is one of the best plants to have, really, um, because people just love releasing the fragrance of yeah. all the different scents. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just a really sensory experience. Yeah, brilliant. Not only is the leaf soft and fluffy, but you've got that amazing fragrance. You know, they're so easy to take from cuttings. So yeah. it's another thing that I do with patients. I like to take cuttings from the pelagoniums, and then they can take their favourite ones home. So that gets me. That's a personal thing. Isn't it? That's yeah. what gardens very much like. That if you have that plant that you struck. Yeah, you propagate exactly. It. And some, for some people, it's the first time they've done that. So it's, yeah, a real achievement. And yeah. It's brilliant and really inspiring. That's how you get them in the door. Yeah. That's how you, they're gardeners for life, I think. Yeah, if get, yeah. If you can get someone to strike a cutting or grow a seed, then like, I reckon you've got them. Yeah, <laughs> and I've seen, I've had people come back, out patients um, that have come back, and they're like, oh, I still got my geranium. It's doing <laughs> yeah. really well. Let me show you a picture. And they're so proud of it. So that makes me so happy. Yeah. I love that. Fulfillment there, it isn't is it? That is fulfillment, fulfillment, yeah. Yep. So you've got some stuff being sown here. This is the stuff you do with the, so, with the yeah, patient? So sowing seeds is actually really good for hand function, um, working on fine movements. Right. So we do a lot of that. Um, yeah, what a brilliant little pl- space this is. And it's and uh, just to describe what this is, it is full. It is full of plants. Uh, it looks great. It's, I mean, yeah, it brings oh, a smile yeah. to my face. <laughs> and benches here, I just want to say, you know, the benches are at a height where you can actually wheel underneath, and that's obviously really important. Right. But, yeah, it's, it's all about access. And so that's a great idea. So they're not a foot back from the no, bench. They're exactly. right up top. Their right. chest is up tight. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But it's always tricky because chairs are so varied. Um, that's something I learned in this job, you know, how different really chairs are so power chairs are a lot higher some manual chairs are really low some are high and so the wheel chairs are a world of their, is yeah, a whole world in itself a whole world of their own and wow. there's no two chairs are the same really they're, they're all different as the charities evolve they they kind of are the forerunner of, of accessible gardening now I think. But so, yeah, no, I don't I think it's probably right to say so in a way you're pioneering this yeah stuff. definitely yeah. And it's, let's just talk about funding for a minute is this private sponsorship so Horatio's Garden is completely funded by donations sponsors and events that we hold yeah it all has to be fundraised right so it's not coming out of the public purse at all it's no, not no, coming no. out of tax it's all no, no, no. private charity raised yeah, yeah exactly so any support we get all goes directly back to the patients and the gardens and keeps these sanctuaries open for them. It's the generosity of people that really keeps the gardens alive. Brilliant. So if you, if anybody listening to our podcast is out there now, if they wanted to donate, which I'm sure a few of them would like to, how would they go about that? Uh, you can go on the website, www.horatiosgarden.org.uk and you can donate online. It's such a, such an amazing project. Um, you must be very proud. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it. Does, I mean, it definitely makes a big difference to people's lives. Brilliant. And I want to just say a massive thank you for coming on the Garden Organic Podcast. It's been a real pleasure to meet you, and I just love love this place as obviously you do. Well, thanks so much for having me, and I'm glad you got to come and visit. And now it's time to open the post bag, Hannah. You have an interesting trio of questions. What's the first one? So the first one's about tomato seedlings. Someone has contacted us and said their tomato seedlings became very weak and have now keeled over without proper root. Can we discuss what might have gone wrong and is it too late to start again? Chris, what do you reckon? Well, I think this is quite common, you know, with seedlings and for a few reasons. Uh, The first one, I would say, imagine this is a thing called damping off, which is a fungus which attacks the base of of the seedling. Or it could be a scarab fly. If it's a scarab fly, you'll see their presence. They're tiny little flies and they flutter around on the above the surface of the compost. But it's more likely to be damping off and that's caused by the soil's maybe too damp. So I don't know what compost you're using. If it's a multi-purpose, you know, do all job compost, that might be causing it. Or the other thing is, and it's usually the reason, is it's overcrowding. It means you've got too much seedling together 
and then damping off kind of goes through them all. So it's quite common. Don't think it's just your failure if you're seeing it happen. I'll give you a few tips to get around it. Probably the best one is to grow them, obviously, in a decent seed compost, as we say all the time, decent peat-free seed compost. And the other one is, is maybe sow them a bit more far apart, in, preferably in cells. When I say cells, I mean individual pots. So you might want to use a biodegradable pot like, pot like a jiffy, which you can then just sink into a bigger pot. And I'd always put probably two seedlings to a pot, but it means they're not all crowded together. And you'll find with tomato seeds as well, you never get that many to a, to a packet anyway. They're not like lettuce seeds. You get like a few. So treat them preciously and make sure you sow them apart. Decent compost, sow them separately. Make sure they're not too wet, okay? Not too, don't walk over water. Remember, they're only babies. They don't need water pulled on them all the time. So maybe that will give you better results. Chris, I think that's really, really helpful. Thank you. And I have to say, I really sympathize with the listener because I had exactly the same problem. It was like the seedlings hadn't created proper roots. So they just keeled over. I think one of my problems was that I was given a propagator for Christmas, which was lovely. It was a great Christmas present, but I've never used one before. And it was damp all the time. And it was damp inside the little pot that they were grown in. It was damp underneath. And I think there was too much water. And I think you're right. I think I had that thing called damping off. And I also wonder if perhaps the seeds were sown too early in the year and they didn't get enough light. Would you agree, Chris? Yes, I think I grow obviously everything in my in my flat, in my home. And so the light levels are much lower than a greenhouse. If you imagine a greenhouse, the light comes in from all sides. So you tend to get a much smaller squat seedling. Whereas if the light's only coming in from through a window, it stretches. OK, so the light levels are much lower. So how do you get around that? It's very simple. Just later sowings. A lot of people will tell you to sow your chilies, your tomatoes, your peppers. Sow them in February. Get them going aubergines. I disagree with that if you're sowing indoors. Sow them a bit later. They get away quicker. OK, so wait a little bit. We're always talking about this. The patience of seed sowing, aren't we, Sarah? Making sure you don't bolt too early. Propagate things quite interesting because, you know, it's a little incubator. It's nice and warm in there and humid. If the cover of the propagator has got water on it, a mist on it, they don't need a drink. So with that in mind, are they OK to sow again? Definitely. Absolutely, definitely. I'm still sowing now. It's now in April. I'll be sowing into May, in fact. And as Chris said, that if you can leave it just that little bit later, you're going to get light, you're going to get warmth, you're going to get sunshine. And I also can now start sowing out in the greenhouse as well, rather than trying to do it indoors. Yeah, I think, you know, um, seed sowing is always good fun. You, I mean, it's it's a bargain, isn't it? I picked up a packet of Tommy seeds for a quid yesterday. Hey, what is there to lose? I'll have such a good time watching them germinate. Yeah, always be sowing is my advice. I think it's the biggest test of a gardener. It's not going too soon on the seed sowing. As soon as the sun comes out, we're like, yeah, let's get going. Yeah, I'll tell you, Hannah, <laughs> even, even the most professional gardeners go too early because we just get excited about it all. I know. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the next question, someone said they'd like to plant a small apple tree in a pot. Is this possible and will they get fruit this year? Chris, kick us off on this one. Well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's not the sort of plant you associate with being in a pot, is it? You associate them with being in fields and, you know, and orchards. And But I do have one apple that I grew because obviously I wanted to try and I'm obviously a big container gardener. And it was one called Discovery and it was a brilliant little plant, self-fertilising, I put it in a pot. It was in there for years and I, I, I got great. I got about seven or eight apples of it every year without fail. And it was a really joyous occasion. But, you know, a lot of us don't have open ground. A lot of us don't have gardens. We grow on balconies. So it's absolutely possible for you to grow an apple. Just make sure you choose the cultivar, the right one. And of course, the other thing is the husbandry. They won't like it if you don't feed them. The pot is uh, leeches, which means the nutrients get washed through it as you water it. The nutrients will deplete. So you need to make sure you give it a top dress now and again with maybe some compost or worm compost feed it some potash an organic potash which will help it fruit and always check for watering and then you'll be away you'll have your very own containerized apples it's interesting isn't it chris i did a little bit of searching for this and i noticed that there are a lot of websites that will offer you a plant in a pot and certainly in garden centers there's lots of possibilities of fruit trees in pots which is very exciting but i'd just like to make a plea if you haven't yet bought that apple tree Try and get it online from an organic nursery. I know there's a number of specialist organic tree nurseries that you can search for, and they'll be able to help you with good advice on which variety is best suited to grow in a pot. But I also feel if you're going to grow your own, make it organic. 
Yeah, it's a fair point. And what about getting fruit this year? They should do because they would have been grown on in a nursery for a few seasons before they get to you. I know when I bought the Discovery cultivar, it fruited fine the first year. So it's not like you're getting a new plant. The nurseryman grows it on, hopefully in a peat-free soil, and then you get it and it'll then produce fruit the first year, no problem. And as you said, Chris, it may only be eight apples, but those are eight very precious apples. And I'll tell you that the taste was just so much better. Another little thing as well, I had it in a pot by the window and the little birds love to sit in it. So it's a win-win all round, isn't it? Brilliant. Thank you. So our last question is one I'm sure is going to get you both animated. All about slugs. So someone's written in and said they've heard that slugs should no longer be labelled as pests. And what are our thoughts on this? Sarah? Well, it is very tempting to label them as pests because we've all, I'm sure, sometimes suffered slug damage and it is devastating. There's no doubt about it. But I think as an organic grower, I think we're much more conscious of the wildlife in our gardens. And let's face it, slugs are part of that wildlife. Let's have a look at the slug itself. The slug is a very important part, actually, of the cycle of breaking down nutrients in the soil to make them accessible to the plant roots. And of course, the slug is also an important part of the diet of some of the wildlife in our garden. That's birds, frogs, hedgehogs, or whatever. So we can't just dismiss slugs or even worse, try and get rid of them all. They have a role to play. I'm no slug expert, but I understand that there's only nine of the 40 odd species of slugs that actually eat garden plants. And the problem, of course, is identifying which ones. And sometimes it feels like all those nine are out to get us. Chris, what are your thoughts about some simple tips to help prevent slug damage? I was just laughing to myself. I think I, I want to get a nine most wanted poster for my allotment shed <laughs> with the pictures of the ones that, that eat away. But you're <laughs> right. I've, I've never liked the word pests. Even as a young gardener before, you know, way before I thought about organics or anything like that when I was learning my trade, it seems very dismissive to me, the word pests, you know. I, they're obviously part of the eco trade. One man's pest is another hedgehog's dinner, isn't it? But I do have a nightmare with them. And so I have to treat it as a practical subject on the ground so I can protect the crops I'm trying to grow. Um, what I've done recently, as I live in London, I apologise, but I have to buy bottled water and anyone who lives in London will understand that because the water tastes so bad out of the taps. I tend to water bottles, I tend to cut the top off them and I use those as mini cloches. And that doesn't only just protect from slugs, it also protects from pigeons, it double bubbles it. So you, you can't, that's really, that sort of barrier is really, really important. But the big thing I think is Try and protect them when they're young and then grow them on before planting them out. So what happens as a seedling grows up, as it matures, more lignin gets into the seed cells. The seed walls become tougher. The cell walls become much tougher. And that means they're much tougher to chew for the slug. And they then will go off and eat something else. So growing on, barrier tends to protect. And observation looking, especially when your plants are small, get in and pick stuff off if you see it. I think plant choice is also quite a key one as well, isn't it? I mean, if you know you've got a garden that's a really good habitat for something like a slug. Don't pick the varieties or the plants that you know they're really going to like. Actually, maybe a hosta isn't for you and have a look at some alternatives. Otherwise, you you know, you're always going to be constantly battling this. I think you're absolutely right, Hannah. And I've got a pair of delphiniums, which I, I love dearly. And wow, do slugs love delphiniums. So every year when those delphiniums first start appearing, those little tender pale green shoots, I'm out with my barriers. I'm out with, actually, that's a good tip, Chris, with the plastic bottles. And I watch them like a hawk until they're mature enough for the slug to ignore them. You know, it's important to understand most of gardening is observation. So if you kind of walk away from something for a week and come back to it, it's more likely changes of the negative kinds might have happened. I think it is really important, though, isn't it, to stop looking at these things that are a bit of an inconvenience as a pest that we need to deal with, we need to get rid of. I mean, the biggest pest in my garden is my dog. It's like, it does far more damage than any <laughs> slug or any pigeon or any other creature. So I think, it, you know, reframing it is really important. Yeah, it is. I mean, you, you're spot on, Anna, you know, AstroTurf plastic, sheets of plastic everyone's put in their back garden. I'd rather see a hundred slugs than that because I know that there's wildlife and there's things going on in that garden. It's part of the, uh, the cycle of everything. It's really important. Just get out and be involved in it. And then I think that's the way to keep on top of your slugs. If there's one thing we know will animate any gardener, it's a conversation on slugs. So really keen to hear what our listeners think. Is there any such thing as a pest? Let us know. We'd love to know. Okay, that was fantastic. Thanks both. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Bye. And thank you for listening. 
Don't forget, if you want to learn anything more about the topics we've discussed, there's loads of advice on the Garden Organic website. That's www.gardenorganic.org.uk. And if you want to share your thoughts on slugs, it's a great debate to be had. Why not contact us on social media? We're at Garden Organic UK. In our next episode, Chris meets the ever-engaging gardener Sue Kent. She's part of the Gardener's World team and a passionate allotment grower in Swansea. Our thanks again to our sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. And thanks to you, dear listeners, for allowing me the journey of a lifetime. It's been a huge privilege from the very start to present this podcast, and I'm so grateful to have had your company along the way. Bye for now, and thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music. <laughs>